is lecture 17 of ECE 2305. So in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at essentially the vernacular when we talk about Wi-Fi. And I think most of you have probably seen this before. It shouldn't be a mystery if you have any if you have a wireless access point at home, or you see other folks on your own laptop. This shouldn't be too difficult to see, right? So we're really just going to be looking at terminology. So this should be a relatively light lecture in terms of um, you know, just getting understanding the lingua franca, if you will, of Wi-Fi before we go into some of the uh, deeper uh, concepts, including um, frames and uh, Mac, Mac accessing. Okay, so the first thing, okay, so basic jargon. Whenever we talk about a Wi-Fi access point, so we call them access points. Um, in a cellular network, usually when we have inf uh, information coming to and leaving in a star topology, let's bring it up. Whenever we have information, so in a cellular network, okay, ah, so let's let's assume that this is, um, well, let's not assume it's LTE. So what we would have is a base station, okay, and then you would have so this is we call a base station, and then you would have a cell phone. Right? So this would be like a mobile user uh, or user equipment or whatever you want to call it. Right? And we'd have multiple such devices. And what happens in a cellular network? Everything communicates between the base station and the mobile user. Right? So there's our star. In a Wi-Fi network, like 802.11, we have the following. So first of all, um, this would be, actually, why am I drawing it like, uh, like that? So you would have, essentially, your access point. You would have one antenna, maybe you have several. And then you would have your laptop. You would have like your smartphone, if you don't want to use your data. Um, perhaps another laptop or a desktop computer. And then these guys would have a NIC. And that would communicate with your access point. So we call so the equivalent in a, a Wi-Fi network would essentially be called the access point. So that's where we would have our, our information come from and be sent to, okay? As opposed to a cellular network where we're connecting with a base station. And then this access point would be connected say, to a cable modem or a Fios modem or whatever, and then be connected to the rest of the network out there, right? Like the internet. So, so, in a y so what happens is these guys, what they do is, um, just like in, no, do they? So like in a Wi-Fi network, what happens is, if you open up your laptop right now, um, what do you see? You see these names come up, right? So for instance, if I open up my laptop, and I scan to see what, what's out there, I would essentially see, you know, Brown House 193, and I know exactly who Brown House 193 is. That's, uh, you know, 193 XYZ Street, and that's the guy next, across the street from me, and he has a brown house, right? Very creative name, um, and, and so on and so forth. So essentially, this is the name, okay? So SSID. The SSID essentially is the descriptor of your access point. So, it, so what happens is your laptop, making sure that you connect to the right access point, you'll say, oh, I see this, is, this SSID, I'm going to connect to that. We see this even in WPI when we want to connect to the wireless network here, right? So we would have WPI wireless, right, as an example. We would have, what, WPI guest, is that correct? And we would also have WPI wireless setup. S3. And then, of course, if any of you are an RBE, you probably see a lot of turtle bots, and then you see Gears bot, and you see WPI robot, and blah, 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 and all these other SSIDs, right? So in general, what happens is each one of these corresponds to an access point, or in the case of WPI, you probably have like an enterprise solution where your access point has multiple um, you know, services that you can access, right? 
So suppose you don't have um, you know, your laptop set up or your wireless device set up for accessing WPI resources and such. You would access, you would first of all connect to this guy, you run some application, it magically makes your phone, oh, ready for uh, WPI wireless, then you get off of it, reconnect to WPI wireless, and now you're all set. If you're, on the other hand, a guest to WPI, you do not have, let's say, your MAC address registered with CCC and all that jazz, but you're here just for the day. This happens to me all the time. So a few times, I organized like this workshop on uh, wireless communications here at WPI. So you have about 100 people. I'm not going to collect 100 MAC addresses, go to CCC and say, give all these people wireless access. No, no. What they say is, let them connect to WPI guest. Um, here's the temporary password and, um, you know, let them connect. And, and then by the end of the day, the 12 hour period, boom, it disappears and these guys no longer have access to WPI resources anymore, right? And then there are other, like, you know, so, so the SSID is essentially sort of a way of uh, getting, in, uh, uh, getting in contact with, uh, say, the, um, uh, you know, your, your access point. And, and then, you know, some folks, like, like for instance, um, I remember one story, this was what, 2007. So I, one of my colleagues actually called, like this was at University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas. What happens is he once called the Lawrence police office and it's like, hey, uh, guys, I can see your wireless network. And it's like, oh, really? Well, what happened is they were testing out um, a, um, a very wide Wi-Fi network that they, th essentially all police cruisers within the city limits of Lawrence, Kansas. It's, it's kind of a big town. It's not the size of Worcester, but it's a big town. And what happens is they're blasting away their SSID. I'm not sure if it was encrypted or not or anything, but, but essentially, you know, this guy was like saying, hey, uh, you know, everyone can see your SSID and maybe try to connect to it, maybe try to hack it and such. So I'm not sure what became of that. But, but in any case, what happens is this is a way for your access point to be visible to any laptop out there or wireless device. Discard. Now, uh, access point, we all know what that means. Uh, that, that's essentially that little, that little doodad with all the blinky lights that's connected to the internet that your laptop, smartphone, and stuff connects to. Now, how many people, okay, this, so this is a trivia question. And, and this might also make you guys scared once I uh, uh, reveal why I'm asking you guys this. So how many people here have a wireless access point? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so let, let me figure out how to ask this. So how many people here have their wireless access point uh, in a very visible location? Okay. Um, how many people here uh, currently leave their wireless access point in a very visible location with the blinky lights visible to everyone. Okay, so um, some, some researchers, so this is a security thing. So several researchers have figured out how to attack wireless access points based solely on the blinking of, of the lights. So the activity lights that you have and such. So there are folks out there that can determine if I ping, let's say this router and stuff, um, what's the response do I get and, and stuff. And they can judge based on the activity of the blinky lights, like, oh, okay, uh, I th like, you know, they can basically try and hack into your uh, Linksys router or whatever, and then onto your network based on the activity lights. So I don't know how, I'm not really an expert in this, but uh, from then on, just like what I do with my webcam on my laptop, I just put a little black tape over it, just, just, just for added safety, you know, doesn't hurt. Anyways, I digress. So station is going to be your laptop. It's going to be your smartphone. It's going to be anything that wirelessly connects to that access point. Kind of weird. Usually when you think of station, you think of something very big. Here the terminology is phone, laptop, computer, you name it. And then there's something called a, por a protocol data unit or a MAC protocol data unit. So MPDU or just PDU for short. And then this is the data that's exchanged between two peer MAC entities. So that could be your access point and one of the stations uh, in order to get services going between the two devices. Okay. So we, we, we can continue on like, you know, into a variety of different types of networks. So we have basic service set and we have enhanced service set. So the basic service set essentially is my home network. I have a wireless access point. I have all these wireless 
the devices connected to it, and that's it. That's my basic service set. On the other hand, um, an extended service set means that we're integrating several BSSs together in, in, into, a, uh, into several lands. And so, so this means that I might have a basic service set here, another one here, like I'll, I'll show it in a diagram in a few minutes, but essentially we have multiple BSSs all connected together in a distribution network, and then that distribution network is connected to the outside world, right? So let's suppose I have several access points at home. Let's say I have one of my own, let's say in the basement, to do whatever, you know, some nefarious uh, research or anything like that. And then I have one for the home, and that's for entertainment purposes and such. And then I have another one, and then they're all interconnected to a single, let's say, wired to a single server, and then that server is connected to the outside world. So we call all that stuff, we call an ESS, or an extended service set. So basic is the one access point and a few devices connected off of it, and then an extended service set are multiple BSSs connected together, and then they're connected to the outside world. Okay? And then the distribution system is how we connect all those ESSs. So what happens is, again, this guy might be isolated, the BSS, um, there's a backbone distribution system, and then usually it corresponds to a cell or a service site. So, so think, where, where would that occur? WPI. So like for instance, for the longest time I was thinking, before I had to do the hard work of fish wiring Ethernet cable through my house. Maybe as a side note, anybody fish wired before? Woo! Any of you gone in the attic to fish wire anything? Ah, okay, so how's that fiberglass, you know? I, I can tell you, fiberglass really, really sucks when you inhale it. So, uh, it, because seriously, like, you know, when I go upstairs, my wife says I'm, I'm just joking around. No, it really hurts when you inhale fiberglass. It's glass. It's fibered glass. So what happens is I really dreaded going into the attic because I don't know what lives there. I always hear, so I didn't like that. Um, it's really claustrophobic. There's lots of fiberglass for everyone. So, so I really was thinking, can I have a situation just like a WPI, where I have wireless access point, down the hallway, wireless access point, next to my office, wireless access point, throughout the entire building, and then I have a distribution system to connect all of them together, and then connect to the internet? And the answer is, yeah, sort of. So what, what, end, what ends up happening is, there are cases, like for instance, in my house, where is my wireless access point? My wireless access point is in the mudroom, the kitchen area and stuff. And my office, whoo, is off to one corner of the house, right? And, the, and then the basement, that's the opposite direction. There's lots of physical shielding, right? There's wood, there's drywall, uh, there's lots of brick, blah, blah, blah. So, and then in this building, God knows what's in the way. Like, you know, the floor, the ceiling, lots of brick, of course. So this is the rationale behind the ESS, this guy over here. And so what we're interested in is, can you have multiple wireless access points connected to, say, a server, and then in turn, that server, um, uh, blah, uh, that server is connected to the internet. And it is possible, right? So for instance, right now, my, like, you know, the way I'm, my, my configuration set up, I know, it's, it's almost like, you know, I'm just describing my home network, so anyone can hack into the Oglinsky household. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is right now, probably all of you have something like this. Cable modem or Fios, whichever one you have, right? And that goes to the internet. And then what happens is this guy probably goes into your wireless access point. So we call it access point, AP. And that has this and then it broadcasts. Yeah, that's exactly how wireless signals look like. Just kidding. <sighs> so now what you can do instead, and this, this is kind of an interesting thought, and this is where your ESS kicks in. Same thing to internet. And actually at the end of this week, we're going to be looking at how you make this a reality, right? So the outside world looking in sees 126, 132, 119, right? at your cable modem. And then internally, 
you have now the internal IP addresses, right? So like you have that 192, 168, 1, 1. And we'll get to that this Friday. So instead, what you could do is you can have a server, server, and then that server in turn. So this is going to form now your DSS. You can have multiple Ethernet uh, ports, right? So you can have, let's say, a server with 10 Ethernet cards. You can have one um, Ethernet card with five, six, seven jacks. Like, for instance, upstairs I have a server that's being used by one of my PhD students and it has uh, nine gigabit Ethernet jacks because we're running eight radios off of it. And so what you can do is then you can, let's say, have a wireless access point. So that's an AP, call it AP1. And it provides service up to 100 meters in an outdoor line of sight condition. So indoors, we're looking at more like 20, 30 meters, maybe. At, that's really optimistic. Here's another access point. We call it AP number two. Here's another access point. We'll call this AP number three. Right? And so we have this distribution network. And then these guys form these little cells, right? These service areas. That is our BSS. That's a BSS. That's a BSS. And then this entire thing here is our ESS. So this is something I really wanted to do, like, you know, going back to my story. What I would love to do, I actually, you know, before marriage, you know, my wife had her own little Wi-Fi access point for her apartment. I had my Wi-Fi access point for my, my apartment. And in the end, you know, when you enter a marital union, what is hers is yours and what is yours is hers, right? And so what happens is we had two of everything. We had two cable modems. We had two wireless access points. We had a bunch of twos, right? So I was thinking, wow, I could create an ESS at my home. We didn't. In the end, I just said, oh, I'm just going to fish wire. And I can tell you a lot about fish wiring another time, especially to say that squirrels are very aggressive when you corner them in an attic, OK? <laughs> they, 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 you know, you corner them, you know. So, <coughs> so what happens is um, this is what we refer to as an ESS. And in other cases like WPI, like for instance, the access points that you have here and their protection, they call enterprise solutions. So enterprise is not what you buy, at least not the $20, $30 wireless access point. You get it at uh, Best Buy. The enterprise solutions are a little bit nicer, okay? a little bit more finesse, a little bit more sophisticated. That's what WPI uses. And so what happens is they position all these devices, and then they go to one huge server that handles all the traffic to all of them. Even, like, I'm, not, I'm not sure how well they do handoff. So for instance, if I have a laptop and then I walk with it and I go to the other side of the building and reach another access point, do they, do, no, it doesn't hand over? Hmm? Yeah. No, no, that's, that's the thing. Whenever I take this guy and then I go to Boynton Hall and yeah. And then I have to turn it off, turn it on. So, so, so let's say they, they don't do handoff well. On the other hand, let's go back to our cellular op uh, example. Cellular. What happens is we totally have great cellular mobile handoff, at least nowadays. In 2008, not so much. But nowadays, what happens is if you leave one service area and you go into another one, unless you're going really fast, what happens is it should be pretty decent. You should be able to continue your conversation and not have any dropped calls, right? So, so this is what's meant by an ESS, right, as opposed to a, D a BSS which is just the one site. All right. One day I should really show a photograph of like what I did. So, phew, I'm pretty proud. Okay, so I think I already discussed that. So, so let's summarize. What did we talk about? So today really is to get you guys in position for what we're going to be talking about the next several lectures. So this week is all going to be Wi-Fi, and we're going to then dovetail into um, uh, IP addresses and the like. So tomorrow we're going to be talking about um, uh, the frame structure that's used in, um, uh, in 802.11. We'll talk about the MAC protocols that are used in 802.11. And then eventually 
Um, uh, we're going to, in, in Thursday and Friday's lectures, we're going to be talking about IP addresses. We're going to talk about DHCP, which is what's used in WPI, as well as NAT, and then wrap things off with um, uh, subnets and the like. Okay, so with that, that concludes lecture 17.